Pope Francis thinks the Latin Mass is disunifying, but I wonder if this Nigerian would agree. Franciscan University cancels the Latin Mass because it's too divisive. Plus, a new law in Delaware would criminalize the seal of confession. Meanwhile, a high school student gets arrested for defending Catholic moral theology on the Catholic campus. Zelensky turns Ukraine into a Davos-styled surveillance state, and faithful Catholics prepare to go back to the Mass Rocks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Michael Matt, and this is The Remnant Underground. With a quick note, the new issue of The Remnant is hot off the press. I encourage you to click the link below and order this. We come out every two weeks with this newspaper, and this one is a very special editorial by yours truly, praying for the happy and holy death of Pope Francis. I think you'll find that an interesting, an interesting article, if you'd like to care to order the latest issue of The Remnant. Now, to the... Breaking news from Clown World. The Latin Mass at Franciscan University of Steubenville has been canceled. Now, I've got a couple of kids at Franciscan, and quite frankly, this is beyond outrageous. Franciscan University was already in complete compliance with Traditionus Custodes. The Latin Mass was offered there only once a month, which is perfect for Traditionus Custodes. It was also offered at the campus chapel of Christ the King, which is not a parochial church, which again makes it in compliance with Traditionus Custodis. So what's going on here? What's the problem, Franciscan? What's the problem, Your Excellency, the Bishop of Steubenville? Now we've covered, we, three years ago, we covered the enthusiasm that was going on at Franciscan University for the traditional Latin Mass. Now, let's just think about that, because we've talked about this before. You know, if we were American Indians, Native Americans, who wanted to do smudging ceremonies, everyone would say, that's such a wonderful thing that you're bringing your tradition back. I'm so thrilled. And I'm curious to know why it is that an institution of higher learning, such as Franciscan, why it can't be seen also, traditional Latin mass can't be seen as also a treasure, a historical treasure of nothing else that would benefit the, the, the students being able to experience their own liturgical patrimony that goes back 2,000 years. Walter, you filmed that, that Mass. You were there, you saw that Mass on a fairly regular basis, albeit once a month. What, was, that, was that pretty typical of how it was? Yeah, every time I was there, that's pretty much how, how fact it was. That many kids? Yeah. I don't imagine they were having discussions about the evils of Vatican II after that Latin Mass at Franciscan University. No, they were a bunch of young kids that were just like, wow, this is really cool, it's great. And they were interested to find out about it. But see, the problem, friends, is that that success story, maybe we'll have Walter throw a little bit more on the screen as we go along here, that incredible success story, where you had Catholics becoming very interested in their own past and who and what they are, young Catholics excited, wow, this is cool, I wanna learn more about this. But that in the minds of this warped, Frustrated old man who's running the Catholic Church right now, this modernist who's running the Catholic Church, in his mind, that's a threat. <laughs> that's a threat to everything. That's a threat to the revolution. That's a threat to the globalist agenda. <laughs> that's a threat to unity. Oh, yeah. Oh, we can't have the Latin Mass. Why, that's disunifying. <laughs> Tell that, Your Holiness, to this beautiful representative of the clans in Africa, in Nigeria. Tell that to her. Mm -hmm. 
Unite the clans with her. God bless her, right? But she's not an anomaly. Just a few years ago, friends, that's the way it was with the mass of the Catholic Church throughout the entire world. Wherever you went, we all spoke the same language. We all understood the Mass. We all saw God being worshipped in a true and proper and dignified and elevated language, an elevated manner, everywhere we went. The Latin Mass unified the entire world against the powers of hell, which is why the modernists have been trying to destroy that Mass since 1965 and before but really since 1965, and of course they introduced the new one in 1969. And last week, Bishop Jeffrey Montforton of the Diocese of Steubenville, Ohio, canceled that Mass at Franciscan University, and this makes no sense. He's even, the good bishop, he's even at odds with one of, I would think, one of the, the, the most popular bishops in this country. The Bishop of Steubenville, Ohio, whoever he is, I haven't even heard of this guy before this happened, uh, but whoever this guy is, he's at odds with Bishop Robert Barron, one of the most famous American Catholic bishops in the world. Now you can see Bishop Barron here, who's a favorite of Franciscan University, at Franciscan University. Let's set it up here. And Bishop Barron now, who is a fair-minded pastor, disagreements notwithstanding, is obviously a fair-minded bishop. And he's right down here in Winona, Rochester, Minnesota. That's where he, he is, he's serving as bishop. And he was simply fair-minded enough to move the Latin Mass for the Latin Mass folks who are in his diocese. He just simply moved it from a church in, in his diocese to St. Mary's University Chapel. And this was to remain in compliance with Traditionis Custodis. Just move it away from a parochial ch church to a chapel at a university. You see? Well, it's quite a beautiful little chapel at that. So Bishop Bear, just, just follow me for a second here. Now, those of you who are saying, well, the, the bishop has the right to, ah, well, the bishop of Steubenville, he had to do this so that he wouldn't be defying the Pope. Okay? Bishop Barron relocates the traditional Latin Mass here to a neighboring university just down the road, while Bishop Monforton, out in Steubenville, cancels the one that was already at a university chapel in his diocese. <laughs> What's going on here, Your Excellency? You're trying to remain in compliance with Traditionis Custodis. Have you read the document? See, the crackdown on the venerable right of Christian worship, even if you're a Protestant. Well, okay, this, this is the, the right of Christian worship going back 2,000 years in, in aspects and elements of it. So it pertains to every Christian in the world. Christian worship goes back 2,000 years. The crackdown on that is the crackdown on Christianity itself. Get rid of all things historically and traditionally Christian, right? Rewrite Catholic history. Rewrite the history of Christendom. All those evil crusades and evil, the, the, the evil Spanish Inquisition. All right, now, everything about the church was hateful and racist and evil, right? Rewriting the whole thing. Bury the liturgy. Bury the doctrines. Bury the dogma. Rewrite Catholic history. Edit the Bible. And replace it now, as we saw two weeks ago, with the one world religion. Now, this whole project, friends, just so you don't think that this is just my opinion, this whole project, what they're doing right now, the Abu, Abu, Abu Dhabi agreement and all the rest, and now the Abrahamic house, this was condemned in no uncertain turn by the Church of the Past, authoritatively by the popes in encyclicals. For example, the 1928 encyclical by Pope Pius XI, Mortalium Animos in which the Pope writes, These ecumenical efforts among false religions can no wise be approved by Catholics, founded as they are on that false opinion which considers all religions to be more or less good and praiseworthy. Now, did you hear that? 
That's Francis. That's what Francis believes explicitly. That's what he says, that all religions are more or less praiseworthy and beautiful and bringing everyone to God and isn't it great? Peace, unity. <laughs> it's the super dogma. It trumps all the dogmas of the Catholic faith. That doesn't matter. What matters is getting along. Well, this, this attitude, this teaching, was condemned by Francis' own predecessors. Pius XI goes on. Those who hold this opinion are in error <laughs> and in distorting the idea of true religion, they reject it and little by little turn aside to naturalism and atheism. And those who support those who hold these theories are altogether abandoning the divinely revealed religion. So that's what this fight is all about. That's what's really going on here. What Pope Pius XI called the abandonment of divinely revealed religion. Did you see Francis at any point of his pontificate say, there is one means of salvation, the church founded by Jesus Christ, established on the rock of same, that is the sole means of salvation. Have you ever heard him say anything like that? No, instead he's setting up the Abrahamic house <laughs> with other religions. What does that tell the world? That didn't really matter, man. As long as you're all getting along, that's the main thing. Dogma doesn't matter. Back to the Franciscan problem. Because there's a pastoral problem there as well. Because what are we talking about at Franciscan University? We're talking about kids. We're talking about college-age kids. <laughs> the Latin Mass is the only Mass that many of them have ever known. How do I know? Because my own daughter goes there. She was three years old when Samorum Pontificum was promulgated by Pope Benedict XVI. The Latin Mass is all she's ever known. <laughs> and so what the good bishop up there is basically saying is, sorry kids, suck it up! You want to worship God as you always have and as your parents taught you to worship God? Well, you're going to have to get the hell off campus now. Behold the tender mercies of the Church of Accompaniment. <laughs> And just, just the injustice and the stupidity of this. The students are not allowed to worship God? Not at the Mass of Charlemagne or something medieval, but they're not allowed to worship God as Padre Pio celebrated the Mass. Padre Pio! I was alive when he was alive. When I was a kid, he died. Not that long ago. They're not allowed to worship at the Mass that St. Maria Goretti worshipped at, Don Bosco, Dominic Savio, Joan of Arc, Thomas Aquinas, Thomas More, name them all, Father Colby, all of them went to this Mass. And yet according to something in Steubenville, Ohio, it's got to go. Some bishop, you got to get rid of that, man. That's divisive. And it's much better to attend a Mass that no saint in history would even recognize as Catholic. And the irony, the sad and tragic irony, Bishop of Steubenville, Ohio, is overseeing a diocese in complete collapse. A 45% decline in mass attendance. Nobody's going to that mass. Only a handful of active priests left, 20-something, I think, are left, half of whom are over 60. It's done. They're over. It's over. Put a fork in it. Bishop Monforton himself, in an interview, asked Crux Magazine, this a few years ago, if our numbers <laughs> keep declining 10 years from now, can we even exist? Asked the good bishop. Probably not, Excellency. Certainly not when you take it upon yourself to cancel the fastest growing community of young Catholics in the world today. I'm sorry, this is, this is just ridiculous, Your Excellency. By, by your own admission, you can't even keep your own folks in your own diocese. You, they cannot even be bothered to come to Mass. You admit you can't do much about that. In 1990, we had 24,729 Catholics that went regularly to Sunday Mass. In 2019, we had 13,702. The numbers 
are the strong empirical evidence. And at the end of the day, friends, this is happening all across the country. And do you know why? Because the 50-year-old Novus Ordo experiment in woke mediocrity has prompted entire generations of Catholics to simply leave the church. But <laughs> according to the Bishop of Steubenville, this is a much more immediate problem. So this is an example, friends. In some of the cases where the bishops are really torn about Traditionus Custodis, uh, they don't know what to do. They don't have a lot of options. You know, everybody's working to try, working with them to try to fix this. But at Franciscan, it's very easy. As I said, they were already in compliance. It's not a parochial parish. They're fine. Franciscan's fine. So this is where, like, if we don't fight back when, it's some, when it comes to something like this, it's just very easy, it's not a good sign. You know, where, for example, are the traditional Catholic professors from Franciscan University? And there are a number of them, and they're solid, and they're good guys. Why, guys? Come on. What are you doing? you got to speak out. You have more influence than Bishop Unfortin. And you know this. This is not a liturgical preference issue. It never has been. It certainly isn't anymore. What we're all looking at right now is a declaration of war on the 2,000-year-old liturgical patrimony of the Catholic Church. The Latin Mass is not our Mass. The little red trans, oh, they're just hung up on Latin and it's like a spiffy. They want Latin. It's not our Mass. The Latin Mass is the birthright of every Catholic in the world. It is the Mass of history. It sustained Christendom for a thousand years. It's the bedrock of Western civilization. It inspired the most glorious cathedrals, the most sublime music and poetry and artists. It lifted up the greatest saints in history. It's the Mass of the Vandeans. It's the Mass of the Cristeros. It's the Mass Don John of Austria <laughs> and his Holy League heard on the deck of their ships at the Bay of Lepanto, October 7th, 1571, right? It's our Mass. As Catholics, it is our heritage. It is who and what we are. For God's sake, brothers, just admit the truth. The thing that happened from 1969 moving forward, that liturgical renewal, it has been an unmitigated disaster. You know it. Why will you not admit it? Well, maybe you won't have to because pretty soon there simply are not going to be any priests left to say that mass. Do you see that plummeting thin red line on your screen right now? That's the number of priests in the United States of America. It peaked in 1969, that number did, and it's been in free fall ever since. Ah, gee, what happened in 1969? Can't imagine. There's a new EWTN Real Clear Opinion research poll out that reveals now that only 24% of Catholics attend Mass even once a week anymore. Our bureau chief here in D.C., Dr. Matthew Bunsen, shared his take on this. Let's take a listen. The influence of secular culture, of relativism, uh, the rise, so to speak, of uh, what have traditionally been called cafeteria Catholics, those Catholics uh, who think that they get to pick and choose which of the teachings of the church they want to follow. It's a disconnect, a fundamental disconnect, I, I fear, uh, that uh, has really impacted so many Catholics uh, of several generations, as I was saying, and the situation seems to be getting worse with each passing generation. So when, when Francis says, we need to join the, the Novus. We all have to go to that Novus Ordo Mass. Does he want us to be part of the mass exodus from the Catholic Church that's going on right now? Is that what he wants? In 2022, only 17 million American Catholics, 17 million out of 88 million American Catholics <laughs> We're attending Sunday Mass. It's last year, friends. Do you, do, you know, do you know what that means? 81% of American Catholics have already rejected the new Mass. So what in hell's name are we talking about here? And now that the Mass is out of the way and the Catholics are out of the way, and the FBI is getting out there ready to round us all up, those who are left, well, now there are states 
that are coming after the sacrament of confession, too. Well, could your religious confession lead to your criminal prosecution? A bill in the Delaware legislature would require Roman Catholic priests to report confession. And we've talked about that before. You go over to that little quiet chapel on a Saturday afternoon, you expect to see the little green light over the confessional box, right? <laughs> well, maybe not. Real soon, maybe not. And imagine what life is like then. You see, that's the, that's the agenda here. That's the end game. Catholic schools that used to dot the landscape of this country, every single town, Catholic school, right? They're dropping like flies in the same period. While more than 600,000 people in the diocese identify as Catholic, the vast majority no longer practice their faith. Since 2000, mass attendance is down by more than 40 percent, as are baptisms, first communions, confirmations, and holy matrimony. We're practicing our vows. And nowhere is the decline more apparent than in the Catholic schools, where decimated enrollments are already forcing mergers at a rapid pace. And those that are, those few Catholic schools that have survived, well, they're not really Catholic anymore, are they? Up in Canada, kids in Catholic school are being arrested for defending Catholic teaching. Free speech and religious freedom under fire again in Canada. The 16-year-old high school student. Josh Alexander shared his thoughts about transgender ideology at St. Joseph's Catholic High School in Renfrew, Ontario. Officials suspended him from class for the rest of the school year, and when he showed up to class for the second semester, he was promptly arrested by two police officers. With my lawyer, I informed them that I would return to school and continue to adhere to my religious beliefs. Not long into that time, I was uh, brought to the office. The principal blocked the exit, so uh, they ended up arresting me, and they charged me with trespassing. I voiced my beliefs, my sincere beliefs, and... Uh, I never directed at a specific trans student that was doing anything. Um, I don't contone their behavior, but I also sympathize with them because they're a victim of our society um, and our education system and our the terrible parents that have encouraged and pushed that on their children. There was conditions they wanted me to agree to in order to return to school. As a Christian, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to accept the falsehood. I'm not going to go along with the mainstream narrative that is completely contrary to God's natural orders. Can you imagine? Can you imagine for a moment if you ever were to hear Francis speak like that with such clarity about the truth, about who and what we are, how God has created it? Can you imagine? Don't you miss it? Don't you miss the fact that the Catholic Church has become, in her human element, has become so useless that some kid up in Canada sounds like Fulton Sheen compared to the Pope today? And the <laughs> Catholic bishops were that busy shutting down Catholics for being too darn Catholic. <laughs> well, they're telling us all we need to go over to Pfizer and get ourselves jabbed. I want to say to all of the Catholics in San Diego and Imperial counties that there is only one real pathway for us as a society out of the pandemic, and that is through the embracing of vaccinations by the whole of our community. So I encourage you to get vaccinated. It is safe, it is effective, it is holy in keeping with Catholic teaching. And as Pope Francis has said, if you receive a vaccination, you're not only helping to protect those around you whom you love so much, but you're helping to protect the whole of our world. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. After a while, doesn't it just kind of make you crazy? <laughs> these guys, these guys, who are they? What are they? Where did they come from? Get vaccinated, keep the borders open. Oh, and by the way, send Zelensky all the money and weapons he needs. After all, Vladimir Zelensky has got digital IDs ready for all of us. On January 19th, USA Director Samantha Power appeared at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland to promote a digital identification smartphone app called DIA. And one of the most incredible things that Ukraine has developed over the last few years is an app called DIA that now delivers 120 services to the people of Ukraine. 
Standing next to power was Mikhailo Fedorov, Ukraine's Minister of Digital Transformation and Vice Prime Minister. Fedorov is a graduate of NATO's educational program in Ukraine and the World Economic Forum's Young Leader Program. He's the key figure implementing what is known as Ukraine's Digital Transformation, a program to transform the country into an electronic state controlled by Silicon Valley, big tech corporations and U.S. military intelligence. So that's what's going on over in Ukraine, huh? Well, that's interesting. Did you know that? It's a little project, it's a little laboratory for the New World Order. It's a little Davos project going on there, and all the bishops are supporting that too. Meanwhile, millions are leaving the church. Tens of thousands of churches closed, Catholic hospitals gone, Catholic schools gone, right? A hundred million babies slaughtered. And the Pope. Pope Francis is out there approving gay unions. I think he's creating a new space uh, for LGBT people. Um, there is a 2003 document from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, against same-sex unions, and the Pope is obviously saying he uh, sees things a little differently. Uh, it is, it's, it's, it's momentous because he's saying it as Pope. He said it before as Archbishop of Buenos Aires. He's saying it on the record, uh, and he's being very clear. It's not simply he's tolerating it, he's supporting it. What are we supposed to do with that? Got any ideas? Just uh, pray and obey? Pray, yes, obey? <laughs> yeah, right. And the bishops? What's their answer to all this? Now here's the thing, friends, we've talked about this before. You know, we're at a we're at a crossroads. This is a serious, a serious moment. Do you think we don't understand and appreciate the danger of scandal? Like, what are we supposed to do with this? We don't scandal. There could be somebody that's just tuned into our show right now, you know, and doesn't know anything about traditional Catholicism, what's been going on. They just hear this guy who's a Catholic taking issue with the Pope. They say, holy cow, that's a scandal, right? It is. It is a scandal. We're gonna, what are we gonna do about this? That's the thing. We didn't cause any of this, we didn't create any of this. What are we supposed to do about this? But we understand what's at stake here. I understand it, it's very keen to my, my, to my career, to what I do, who I am. My grandfather was a Knight of St. Gregory, made so by Pope Pius XI. My great-grandfather, the fellow that wrote this book, by the way, still available, we just went into the second printing on that, if anybody wants to get this book, Letters to My Protestant Friend, it's my great-grandfather, right? He was commissioned, part of this, these are some of his articles, some of his letters that he wrote 100 years ago, commissioned, these men were, by Leo XIII, Pope Leo XIII, to go out and use the pen, the Catholic pen, the Catholic press apostolate, as loyal sons of the church to fight against the enemies of the church, to defend the papacy, right? Against the German enlightenment and the secret societies and everything else. That's my heritage. That's how I grew up. Can you imagine how foreign and ridiculous it is now? How devastating it is to be looking at the Vatican and saying, I can't support just about anything you're doing anymore. And whose fault is that? I went to Catholic schools. I was trained by Catholic nuns and priests and Catholic parents. Everything that I've talked about today, everything I talk about on this show, I learned in Catholic school. The teaching, the infallible teachings of the church, which nobody seems to give a damn about in the Vatican anymore. So whose fault is that? When I die, I will be judged for my fidelity to God, for my fidelity to Catholic tradition, for my fidelity to the Bible. I will not be judged by fidelity to a modernist pope who can no longer be defended. <laughs> and you know he can't. And you're all so woke out there, right? These supporters of Francis. You're so just violated and upset by the sexual abuse that's gone on in the church. Something has to be done, right? So exercised about sexual predators, aren't you? Until it has something to do with Francis, then it's just silence as the grave. 
Why are you so silent about the Pope's good friend right now, this week? <laughs> that Jesuit pervert with those weird homoerotic paintings he's got all over the world. What's his name? Rupnik? He's a predator. He's a predator priest. Everybody knows that. And last week, <laughs> he's out in the Vatican. He's out in Rome. He's con celebrating Mass in a major basilica just down the street from St. Mary Major where all the tourists hang out. Here's this high-profile guy who was kicked out by the Jesuits, ex ex excommunicated for a time for abusing 20 nuns, sexually abusing them. And there he is saying Mass publicly under the very nose of Pope Francis. <laughs> Where's Francis? I guess he's busy, right? He's got to shut down masses, traditional masses for one thing. According to Archbishop Vigano in the, in the, in the pages of the Renner, we've been covering a story lately, the last few days, where Francis is busy canceling a community of 13 beautiful Benedictine nuns in Pienza, Italy. Their crime? I'm kind of too Catholic. They too like the Latin Mass. They're a problem for Francis. Well, the, well, the predator guy? He's over there celebrating Mass right down the street from St. Peter's, publicly. 20 nuns he sexually preyed upon for years. But Francis has been going after the Catholic people with a vengeance. He's not ashamed or afraid there. He jumps right in. Remember when he took out the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate for some reason? Well, these, these are the bad guys in the church of, of Pope Francis. Friends, <laughs> in conclusion tonight, this madness cannot last. As we say every, every single show, the, the, this, the, the world, the church has gone through holy, hellish times before, and this is a hellish time once again, where scandal is everywhere where priests are giving scandal, bishops are giving scandals, popes are giving scandal. It's happened before, and it's happening again now. So hang in there. I'm not telling anybody to leave the church, give up, despair, right? You gotta fight. We're not the only ones who see this. And that's the big consolation I say on this show all the time. I remember that the 1970s, we were so alone, not so anymore. There are thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, who see that something is really, really wrong. Really, really, really wrong in the Catholic Church right now. We've got bishops and cardinals and priests and lay people all over the world who are preparing to do whatever it takes to, to, to keep the faith. And that's our job now. If necessary, we will go back to the mass rocks that we discussed in, in our last program. Now what you're looking at here is a depiction of history it's happened over and over again. It happened in the Bande, happened in the Cristeros, happened in the Western Uprising in England, happened in Spain, happened in Italy. But what you're seeing here is during the 17th century, the persecution in England and Ireland, the penal laws were imposed to prevent people from attending the Latin Mass, from practicing the Catholic faith. They, these penal laws prescribed fines, imprisonment, and severe penalties, including execution, for priests who offered the Latin Mass and for faithful Catholics who attended the Latin Mass. So the traditional Catholics in that time took to the woods to have Latin Masses celebrated on makeshift altars and on piles of rocks, rocks which became known as the Mass Rocks. And it's on those Mass Rocks that the Latin Mass was preserved through a hundred years of anti-Catholic persecution. It's possible we are going to have to return to the Mass Rocks in the woods, just like the Vandeans did, just like the Irish and English Catholics did, just like the Cristeros did. And if that happens, so be it. We've been preparing for it. We've been telling those stories all of our lives. We told those stories so that our children could learn, could grow up understanding. It may come down to them doing something similar in our time. That's the point of telling those stories. There's no time to give up the faith. And so in the spirit now of the Irish Catholics, the giants, the legends, the lions of our Catholic faith, our Catholic fathers, forefathers, in the spirit of the English martyrs, 
who coined the phrase, it's the mass that matters. In the spirit of the French Vendeans, who also took to the woods, in the spirit of the Mexican Cristeros, we are called to do the same. It's the mass that mattered then, and it's the mass that matters now.